I feel myself as a global citizen because I, I always feel that when you grow up from a nomadic community, you, you, you don't feel yourself that you belong to one space and very locked land. No, you feel that you, you belong to the open space. You belong to all the peoples and you live in harmony with even fishermen, uh, farmers, you are pastoralists or someone who is going to the office. So you, you feel that and this is the open spirit of growing up in a nomadic community. Let me tell you like a little history about me. Please. Welcome to Inside Ideas brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Today, I am so excited. I have the wonderful honor and uh, to introduce someone so fabulous to you, Hindu Umaru Ibrahim. She is a United Nations Sustainable Development Goal uh, advocate and environmental activist and member of Chad's pastoral Maboro community. Hindu began advocating for indigenous rights and environmental protection at age 16, founding the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad, stands for AFPAT, to introduce new income revenue activities for women and collaborative tools such as 3D participatory mapping to build sustainable ecosystem management and reduction of natural-based resource conflicts. Her vision is to grow support for both traditional knowledge and science to improve resilience to climate change, especially for rural communities. She was a member of the Indigenous Peoples of Africa Coordinating Community and served as co-chair of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change during the historical United Nations Climate Change Conference COP21 in Paris. She is dedicated to the protection of all Indigenous peoples from the Congo to the Arctic and the value of their knowledge in the fight against climate change. She advances environmental protection for indigenous peoples by participating in international policy dialogues held around, held around three Rio conventions, climate change, UNFCCC, biodiversity through CBD, and desertification from UNCCD, pressuring governments to recognize land rights of indigenous peoples and advance their solutions for climate adaptation and mitigation. Ibrahim's work with indigenous communities at, at the local and global levels has achieved broad recognition and support, including the Pritzker Emerging Environmental Genius Award, the Daniel Mitterrand Prize, appointment as a UN Sustainable Development Goals Advocate, Conservation International Board Member and Fellow, and Louis Walton, senior fellow, an EAD advisory board member, and of course, the most important, the National Geographic Explorer, kind of how she started out. She was recognized by the BBC as top 100 women leader and by Time Magazine, women's leaders in climate change. Her TED talk on indigenous knowledge meets science to solve climate change and has surpassed more than 1 million views. I could go on and on. It has been an amazing road, has it not, Hindu? I think. <laughs> Did I leave anything out? Uh, no, I think you really say all, but I mean, it, it's not that one who defined me. It's not having all this long list that define me. I think it's very simple to define me. It's just like an indigenous, Mbororo woman does it, then it can cover all the rest. Exactly. That's, it's about the message. It's not about all the words and recognition. Your message is so strong and you're such a wonderful person. We, uh, our paths, I believe, have crossed many times at the uh, climate conferences, but it really truly crossed in Songdo, Korea at the NAP Expo where we were uh, participating in the Resilience Frontiers program through the National Adaptation Program as well with the UNFCCC. And I know I just 
had a wonderful time with you there, but I really got to see the deep passion and insight on your voice for indigenous peoples. And, and I, I, you changed my life. I must say that it was so wonderful <laughs> that to meet you and participate with you because your wisdom and knowledge um, is surpasses all. So that's kind of our, a little bit of our history, how we came together and how, how we've met. But I, I really wanted to almost start out right away with the question, how have you, how have you weathered? How have you gotten through this pandemic time? Um, uh, how has it been for you? Um, yeah, I think the world is facing a very difficult time now. And then what's special about this pandemic, because it is same like the climate. It is not respecting any frontiers. It's crossing all from developed to developing countries, from all our nation across all the oceans and showing us how as human beings we are very vulnerable. So I'm experiencing that through a very difficult time because as I am coming from a nomadic pastoralist community and who are living in very remote area where there is no electricity, no televisions, so we can't talk about the internet. Even there is no radio that covering all the place where my people are moving around. And while we are uh, just following the uh, uh, path of the rain to move from one place to another one, and then the season do not wait for the virus to pass before to come back. So the season are continuous the dry season, rain season are doing the same rhythm that they do have. But with the corona, they close all the borders. And even in the one country like Chad, they close also the uh, subnational. Yeah. And then my people do not cross one place to another one to go after the rain. Like in this time, normally some of my peoples supposed to be in Central African Republic and others around Cameroon, but they are all locked down in Chad. And you know what's happening? Just so like since last year, all the cattle start dying around Lake Chad. All the cattle start dying. So all the photos that we are seeing that sharing through uh, WhatsApp is that the cattle is dying and when the resources are not there, the people become more vulnerable, and especially the old peoples and the children. So, so that's exactly what is happening. It's not only the virus, but it is yeah. only the food security of the peoples, the way of life of the peoples, and all what we are doing to protect the environment become, become now in a very complicated way. I, I, really I hope it's agree. good for you. How are you experiencing it? Uh, I've actually, honestly, it's been a, a time that we need to respect and it's been a great pause and, and uh, it's very serious. But what uh, for me, it's actually been one because of the message that you and I um, present to people about the sustainable development goals and about uh, resilience and sustainability in general, it's been a really busy time. So the projects have picked up, the people who have heard the message in the past or who haven't heard the message and need help during this time, I've been put in a unique position to be able to help them, to offer them the knowledge and the services that I have to, to help them through this difficult time. So it's been both good and bad, it's been uh, fortunate, but it, uh, um, my projects have tripled and I'm, busier than ever trying to spread the message and help people to build in that resilience and that sustainability into their life and into their businesses and how they have that effect on the world. And what you just said on how this period of time has kind of both been both things for you um, and that it's really tied to the bigger the bigger elephant in the room is this climate change and climate crisis that we're in that has caused and made a pandemic like this much worse than usual. And then, then comes the lockdown periods. As a, the, the other reason I asked and really wanted to know, I'm so glad that you're okay and that uh, 
that you've, you know, I, I'm sure it was a lot, a big time for you to kind of do house cleaning and reset and work on projects and, and have the time because you normally travel like crazy all over the world to spread the message as well. But as a nomadic tribe, as, as a Maboros, uh, uh, and I'm not sure I'm saying that right. Mabo is it Maboro? Is that correct? Mbororo. Um, Mbororo. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, they're nomadic and they travel up to hundreds of kilometers a year, sometimes thousands of kilometers a year um, uh, with the herd, with um, uh, looking at the environment. You spoke about this in your TED talk. Was there any, besides climate change, were there any precursors or warning signs that you were seeing that our biome, our climate was um, not diverse enough to handle a virus like this, to handle something like this or, or things that were, were, that helped you guys as a nomadic, resilient, movable tribe to come through this time a little bit better than others? I think, uh, I mean, I can say better than others or worse than others because already the virus killed 100,000 of people around the world. Yes. So those who have even the best hospitals, uh, the best uh, ventilators, the availability of the people also died. So for us who do not have even the hospital. The basics. Nothing, it's it's the, the basic one we don't have it so i mean hopefully for now we don't have any cases so far because also we are living in a community who is a very remote area than others so that make us maybe protect for now because we don't have an access uh or open door to just to meet with other people that for now but when there is food insecurity so people do not stay in the same place they have to go to look for something that to feed them families and it's going to be the contact with other peoples and that worries me a lot because there are some cases who are around the big towns uh, Chad is not a big uh, i mean a, a big populations around the world uh -huh. we are a landlocked country we don't have like any sea border the nearest sea it's up to 1,500 kilometers. So that's mean we are really in the lock place, but we do have about 1,000 cases. Okay. So it's really like not normal. If you are far from all this connection, you must be much protect, but no, it is not the case. We have more than 1,000 and we have more than 100 people died. So those around all the big countries. And then the issue is uh, there is no uh, way to know who have the corona or who have not because it's becoming a marginalized things. People do not say, I, I am sick, I have the symptom because you will be rejected yes. from the communities. It's happened already. Someone who gets sick and then he gets recovery is a young person and yeah. he got rejected by, by his own family. He end up homeless in our countries because we don't have That's homeless. crazy. Yeah. He, he sleep in the chat. So in my community, uh, the worry for us, it is when you contract this pandemic, it's going to be very difficult to get access to the hospitals. So the only thing that from the community we are doing now, it's turning up to our traditional knowledge. We are not sure if it can heal the uh, pandemic, but at least it can heal some symptom because we do use always as usual, the herb or plant to, uh, uh, to calm down the fevers, to help people for the diarrheas. And then uh, for when you are coughing, you know, like which, which herb, which plant that you can boil it and drink and uh, uh, how isolated that you can be, which kind of covering that you have. So our own basic system that we used to use for our other sickness, so we continuously like using it. I give you the example last week, uh, my organization, so we went to eight communities because so the communities also right. live like far away. For around Lake Chad, where is the very dramatic uh, climate change there. 
So then in that place, they found people inside the water because where there is water and pastures, they was there. So then we start like explaining to them what is happening, which measure they can take and giving them some mask for those who have to go out from the communities and some soap because you know people do not have even yeah, they don't water even have soap. for drinking yes so they can have like water for washing hand or gel to put in the hand it's very luxury things i'm seeing in developed countries and when they say like wash your hand every four hours with the soap and then use the gel I'm like, okay, in my peoples, they do not have even clean water for drinking from, for themselves. So they can't wash their hands. So for us, environmental impact and this pandemic increase what is already happening, increase the impact of the climate change, the vulnerability of the peoples and adding to them again, poverty and malnutrition in the communities. But yeah, we do our best to help ourselves with our own knowledge, this is the most important part. Yes. The community come in solidarities. They yeah. come all together, helping the most vulnerable. It is not like uh, uh, when I eat, I don't care about my neighbors. So when you have a piece of food, you share it with your neighbors. And if you don't have, and all of you don't have together. So that's really the beautiful. That's part. beautiful. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I, I know your chat is your home and, and uh, it's where your heart is, I'm sure. But you represent indigenous peoples all around the world from, from every corner, from Chad to uh, the Antarctic, I guess, or to, to wherever indigenous people live. And you represent them very well. <clears throat> With that and your numerous travels that you do, there's this term that we've heard of global citizenship or global citizen, because you're spreading the message, not only through these indigenous um, uh, peoples, but also all around the world for the UN at the World Economic Forum for Conservation International, and you have this global type of a reach. Do you, one, feel like you are a global citizen and how would you feel about the removal of borders, of, of walls, of limitations uh, in our world? Uh, what is your view and your feelings and your understandings of, of this? Yeah, um, actually, Mark, you say, I feel myself as a global citizen because I, I always feel that when you grow up from a nomadic community, you, you, you don't feel yourself that you belong to one space and very locked land. No, you feel that you, you belong to the open space. You belong to all the peoples and you live in harmony with even fishermen, uh, farmers, you are pastoralists or someone who is going to the office. So you, you feel that and this is the open spirit of growing up in a nomadic community. Let me tell you like a little history about me. Please. My, my, my family, my communities and me, we do have our own family split it in five countries in Chad, in Africa. So we are in Chad, like I'm a Chadian because I get born in Chad. So uh, my mom and dad also. So my uncles was born in uh, Cameroon. So like my father brought us directly, born in Cameroon and have all the children, the grandchildren, whatever. Mm -hmm. And my uncles directly in Central African Republic with all the children and then they, they do have the nationality from there. Uh -huh. And then my aunties and others in Nigeria and others in Niger and some of them in Sudan. So I can say like, it's just, uh, um, maybe it's the family or parents. No, it's my direct cousins who are yes. split it and who can come with a different passport there. And why we are belonging to all this? Because we are nomadic, because we used to have our big land before the colonizations. 
And for me, that's why I found the world become very ridiculous when just so they decided to cut the border and divide the families, divide the communities, divide even the ecosystem because we can't have a same legislations in two countries who sharing the same ecosystem. So that's really ridiculous. If we do have the same legislations for all the tropical forests, same legislation for all the wetland, for all the dry land, for all the desert, I think that might give a big impact. And something else, like as human being, we are just a one species yes. of the nature. So we are not like we are human, and then the rest are animals, plant, herb, or whatever. No, it is the symbol, uh, the symbol is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, way of life between all the different species that make the nature diverse, and that is the diversity. So we are as human part of this diversity. That's how I'm feeling that I'm a citizen of the world. I can not talk about protecting only my community, only my peoples, without talking about protecting the Sami peoples who are the indigenous people of Arctic, or without talking about protecting the Batwa who are the indigenous peoples of the Congo Basin, or without talking about the, uh, 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 the indigenous peoples in uh, Amazon or in the Pacific. So for me, all indigenous peoples depend and belong from a, a specific ecosystem. And then we can't just to put our effort to protect one ecosystem and say, okay, the rest we will come back later. No, it has to be in the same time. And that's how I feel and why I feel that I can't only fight for the right of my people without to fight for the right of all the rest of indigenous peoples, even those who are fighting more than me or those who do not have even the voice to make it here. So I have to make it. And that's why I feel like I'm a global citizen. I born a global citizen. That's so wonderful. Uh, I, uh, in Resilience Frontiers and Song Do, there was Professor Chin there and he talked about homo symbios. I, I don't know if you remember and that we really need to become part of the symbiotic earth, realize that we are no different than any other cultures, that we're all distant cousins and that we're all an integral part of the system of our earth. And you said it so beautifully and eloquently. I, I as well grew up a global citizen. My father was American, my mother was German, my grandmother was Austri from Austria. And at a young age, I visited my family all over the world in Europe and, and the United States. And so it's, it's really beautiful to, to, to have that feeling. And the people that we associate with, especially at the United Nations, are a mix of every, everyone on this. You know, we, we hear the discussion a lot about this, this map behind me that there, the World Bank is a physical brick and mortar place. No, this is our World Bank. It's every resource, everything on our planet. Hi. It's where we live, it's our only home, and we're all moving in the same direction. I, I, I love how, how you put that, and I know you are a global citizen, and thank you for giving uh, me your insight and our listeners on on how to look at that so you you've 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 weathered this period um, very well you you you're showing the concern and t speaking about where we need to go um, forward and what needs to happen what the realities are not only for Chad but other places in the world that at the World Economic Forum this year, which we were both there, you gave such an eloquent um, uh, voice in a panel discussion there. Now the World Economic Forum is, is saying we're in the midst of a great reset. We need to reset and not go back to to the way things were or business as usual that we need to really change. And that was also your message at that time, your, your message was very similar to that, that in regards to climate change and to action. 
and, and to kind of stop the talk and really let's move forward in a new system. Can you tell me how you feel about the Great Reset? If you um, ha uh, have, have a, a vision there similar to that, or has it increased even more? I, I think we talk a lot. We did talk a lot, and especially at the international community, we need always like to argue, to show the cases, and then to explain the cases, and then it's take us like years and years and years before any like written agreement between the world nations come. And then after this written agreement, we say like, okay, fine, how would we implement it? And who do what? Who put the money? Who put the action? And then it's become again a process, years and years and years. But I think no, we wasted a lot of time. And it is not time to argue anymore. So like in the World Economic Forum, there is no sustainable business without sustainable planet. Yes. Because why they are businessmen? Because they just like uh, are businessmen because they are doing it and they, because there is no businessman who call them businessman. Otherwise, we all will be a businessman. We all will be the same. So yeah. it can not work like this. So they have to shift all what they are doing to protect the environment, to protect the people, put people centers in all the action that they are taking. And that can help us to see where we are going all together. So, I mean, I used to be, I used to say like one thing that we have to understand, even people who are very rich of the world, who are attending this World Economic Forum, who are deciding for it. And even someone in my community who never turned up a light, they have three things together. All of them depend on the air that they're breathing. And all of them depend from the water that they're drinking. It can be clean water. It can be water in the bottle with gas, without gas, but it's called it water. It's a natural resources. And then they all need to eat the same food in the tables. So it can be like you eat meat every day or you eat, eat cereal or whatever. It has to be in meat. So you can be anyone in this S. You need these three things to be survived. So that's the most important thing. Why we do not just to focus our energy and protect what is important for us, protect what give us food, what give us clean air, what give us water, because that all what, it, what is about it. So if we are doing a sustainable business, the, the, uh, I mean, the business people do not cut the forest. They are uh, just to recycle things. They respect the human being. They put the equality and then the justice, so they are saving themselves. They are not saving the rest of the world. They have to save themselves. And if someone in my community moving from one place to another one in order to give break, a natural break to the ecosystem, to get regenerated in the natural way, he's saving also his life. But at the end of the day, when we addition all, it is saving our planet. And I think yeah. you said well, Mark, the map behind this, our World Bank, so what is the bank? It is our common features. And that's all what we need to set. We need to save our common features. It can come from technology. So these technology have to be in the equal way, adapt to all the reality that we have and share it among all the peoples. It is from the traditional knowledge. We have to respect it and value it and then give all what is needed to protect this knowledge and to pass it from one generation to another one. And then we can cross the knowledge system together and we can build our better features together. So it is time of action. It is not time of talks anymore. I totally agree. And you really touched on two important parts. One we already discussed with the global citizen. There are politicians and leaders and borders and nations that are making decisions in their localities uh, for us that are affecting the entire world. And I'll get, there's many examples, but one example is Bolsonaro by allowing the rainforests to burn. 
that doesn't just affect Brazil, it affects the entire world and our biome, our ecosystem, and um, is affecting not only indigenous peoples, but everyone in the world because we are breathing the same air, we are drinking the same water, we are eating the same food. And our earth is not only our resource, but if we do this homo symbiosis or this symbiotic earth where we become part of our ecosystem and our world, things go much better. And so I, I like that, you know, your, your reference to global citizens and that we have to have this balance of, of action, but there are um, reasons why we, not only we need to raise our voice, but raise our actions because there's people in places making decisions for the world that they shouldn't do because there are no borders that exist that hold the air back just in Brazil or hold the biodiversity back just in Brazil. It doesn't, our planet doesn't work that way. So really this homo symbiose, you know, we, we, we're global citizens and, and uh, we should have a voice all around the world. Uh, we should be able to realize that decisions made in other parts of the planet affect us and, and um, realize how we can divide the stewardship of our planet, not by nations and borders and walls, but how can we collaboratively work together as humanities? The wonderful thing is, since we work for the United Nations, is every country uh, is represented at the United Nations and has the opportunity to present a voice and take part in, in the plan of things. My question that I ask a lot in, in our discussions, and I ask people this all over the world, is the burning question WTF. Now, some people might think that's a bad word, and it's not. It's a simple question of what's the future? And I want to, I would like you to answer what's the future, Hindu? Personally, I think the future can look like what we wanted to build it from now. So if we wanted to build the future from now moving forward, the better future where there is will be equity, justice, sharing of the resources, and protecting the nature and the peoples. So the future will look like very great and we will save all what we want. But to do it, we need like a very radical transformation from all the peoples and from all the nations. It can be from developed countries where they have to stop the fossil fuel, shift from it, uh, all those uh, uh, pollute, pollutions to the renewable energy, uh, put the uh, uh, favors to the uh, climate justice, to the environment protection, to the restoration of the ecosystem, to the economic change, because it's not only the environment, it is the system that needs to change to the democracy, more democratic world, to give the citizen the power, and from developing countries to take a new model of development, to, to think about not like a, uh, a mystique that the developed countries did, but build from a new system where the population can get access to the power, to the, uh, to the justice, to the uh, basic development needs and then the future will look really like great. And for me, like, what is the future? The future, it is about generations because it is not about like, okay, the future is something that coming far. It is about the generation. It is about how you can have your kids, how you want to raise your kids, to respect each other, to respect the different colors, to respect the different peoples, to respect the diversity of the world, the different languages and to integrate all this diversity and live with them. The future, it's about what we are leaving to our children and what our children leaving to them grandchildren. The future, like for indigenous peoples, for my peoples, it is about the next seven generation that coming up. And to have the seven generation coming up, you need to think about the last seven generation that passed to build it. 
So then the future for me, it's about like, I know the names of seven generation of my grandfather, like my father, the father of my father, the father of the father of my father, into seven of them. I have to know them, name them, and know what they did in them lives. And that can help me to build up from my children to them grandchildren until the seven generation. What am I going to leave for them? So I think this is the future. And if we all think like this, I think we can have the better futures. This is my really best wish for all of us. And I think we have a window to do it. Beautiful. We can do it. Yes, we definitely can do it. And uh, I, I agree with you. What, what you say is so um, congruent and, and with many other things that we discuss. So not only the generations, so the core, there are many definitions of to be sustainable or to have sustainability, but it's really about having resources for future generations to be able to pay your workers, to be able to feed your family, to be able to have enough resources to live in the future, to sustain yourself for many generations. So I like that, that wisdom and the way you put it. The, the great thing with this, this question, the burning question, what's the future, is uh, you also mentioned we need to be now on a very expedient or what they're calling the exponential roadmap to 2030, mm. which is the sustainable development goals. Now, when we speak to people, we speak to tons of people. I speak to a lot of business people, a lot at the World Economic Forum. You did as well. What we're seeing is that when you, you to, for a long time, when you speak to people about sustainability or about environmentalism or, or things that they can do, they always say, oh, that's expensive or uh, it's, gonna, it's hard to do or um, is there going to be profit in it? Are we going to be able to have resources and continue business doing that? I want to tell you a couple positive things that I'm sure you already know, but I, I don't know if our listeners know, is through this great pause and reset, um, we've, we've had some benefits. The first one is every year we have this thing called the Earth Overshoot Day. So last year, the Earth Overshoot Day was July 29th. And just uh, two weeks ago, I believe it was, the new Earth Overshoot is August 22nd. So we've gained about 32 days uh, of extra time just through this pause, this reset, less movement, less emissions, better stewardship of, of our planet, even though it wasn't uh, what we wanted, it was kind of uh, forced upon us, but it's, it's something that really, in some respects, really helped our planet. Now, to go to what the businessman wanted, would want to hear, or the investor, or the board, um, all environmental social governance, divestments and investments outperform, outperformed their conventional counterparts um, by leaps and bounds during this time. In the, in the last quarter of last year and in the first quarter of this year, all ESG stocks and investments outperformed their conventional non-sustainable counterparts. And it is a better business model and operating system to change and have a good stewardship over our environment, over our resources, over the way we do business. It's not only a better business model, but it also is, a, 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 I hate to use the word profitable, but it's a long-term more sustainable for business. Those businesses that did not have those plans, that did not implement sustainability in their plans, a lot of them have had layoffs, a lot of them had to close down their doors, and they didn't weather it through this time at all. Those who, were, who did that, they were in a better place to create respirators and create soaps and masks and help people with food during this time. And that leads me to what you do as a sustainable development goal advocate. I, I believe you do believe that we have a solid plan to reach 2030. And I would like you to tell us what your view and your message is for the sustainable development goals to humanity and when you speak to someone about them, um, 
how you do that, how you help them understand how vital they are. I think the beautiful things that we got from the UN, you said very earlier, it's coming all the nation of the world together. And in the equal way, you can be a big country or a small country in the size or in the uh, economic or in the number of the citizen, you have the same one voice. And these beautiful things help us to get the SDG, who are the Sustainable Development Goal, and who set up by 2030, the world need to change and change by giving all the 17 goals from the food and security to the hunger, to the education, health, to gender equality, to water, all the water, oceans, fresh water, or to the uh, environment, to the business, to the construction, to the industry. I mean, everything that we have in our life coming together and closing door is the partnership. That's why like, I love the SDGs. Then I found that SDGs are the best roadmap that we do have to get us out from what crisis that we are living now. So when I talk to the people who know the SDGs, they know already like the 17 goals, they know each of them, and they know they are very important. So what I tell those people who know already what is SDG, it's telling them to do not choose one of them, to implement all the 17 goals together. Because if you don't have like a good education, you can have a good health. If you don't have a good industry, you can not fight the hunger or poverty. And if you don't save the oceans, you can't protect the biodiversity. If you do not fight the climate change, you can have a equality or justice or gender. And you cannot also have a sustainable and peace. And to do all, you have all to come together from civil society, governments, business, men, women, teachers, volunteers. Everyone have to come together and put them hands in this action in order to achieve them. So that's what I talk with those, the people who understand what is SDG and telling them that each action is count. You can do that in a smaller scale, you can do that in the biggest scale, but just to put it in the same way that the SDGs are, then it's work. But the most important, if I'm talking to the people who do not know the SDGs, who do not know like the R17 gods somewhere, the RUN somewhere, who decided on it. And when you come to Africa or to around my region in Sahel, like 80% of the population depend from the rainfall, from the agriculture, from yes. the fishery, or from the pastorals. They do not depend from the end of the month's salary. So that means they didn't want to school, they do not know how to read or write, or even if they know, they do not know what is the U and on what is the SDGs. So my talks to those people, it's like, you have to change your way of life. It's simple. SDGs, it is the way of our life. And what is the way of our life? It is also like how you can give the better education to your children. Even you don't have the school, but you can give the education to your children that respecting your neighbors is very important. It is part of the education. Uh, managing well the natural resources is very important. It is part of the education. And protecting your, your, your environment, it is part of your health and your food system. So uh, creating like a social cooperation between people, this is the industry, this is the business. So like g giving the rights and then coming together, deciding together. So it is just like the way that I'm using to talk to the people who know the SDGs or who do not know the SDGs. But I think in this way, uh, the most important for me is how you can help the governments who take these decisions to implement the SDGs in the daily action plan at the national level. And how from the national level they can localize the SDGs to make them local and implement them in the local level. 
and this is the the way of leaving no one behind because if it's the capital who's deciding for the rest of the world for the rural areas they are leaving them behind but if they localize the sdg they give them the way to decide about what they will which kind of development they want how they are participating this is the sustainability so if you you put someone in the heart of the decisions he make it his decision and it's become more sustainable than when you design thing and you give him it can't work anymore he always like wait and say if it didn't work it is your problem if it's work, it's fine, but he don't, he's not caring if you do not do the follow-up. But yes. if he did it himself, it can be more sustainable ever. I love that. Thank you so much, Hindu. It's so beautiful how you address the sustainable development goals and go in deep on not only how uh, you speak to someone who already is aware of, of of what they are and someone who doesn't know about the sustainable development goals in the beginning you also um, reference that the sustainable development goals are a system that it's virtually impossible to just work on one and not work on the others if you were to pick you know no poverty red and say oh that's my favorite color red no poverty that's the one i'm going to work on um, most people who do that or would try that would realize it's virtually impossible to not only not touch on zero hunger, quality education, uh, life on land, life below water, clean water and sanitation, um, production and consumption, and on and on, because they are all a system and tied together. And so if you use a systems approach, a critical thinking systems approach to solve uh, our global grand challenges and address the sustainable development goals. That's truly how we solve problems. Now you were at the COP21 in Paris. Um, that was the sustainable development goals came out first, September 24th, 2015. And then you were uh, at COP21 where the signing of the Paris, or at the agreement of the Paris agreement. And then later it was ratified. It's a historical, precedence not only were you in a historical place and moment in time to to witness that i i was there as well and it's a beautiful thing but the other realization that people don't have that you also touched upon is it's the world's first ever global earth shot moon shot action plan and it's a historical event you and I both know from politicians and delegates, it's hard for two countries to agree upon where they're going to eat lunch or, or decide on anything, let alone 100, over 193 countries to say, this is the roadmap, this is the plan for the future. And that is such a beautiful thing, which also is like the 17th SDG this partnership, this coming together, this breaking down borders, walls, and barriers to reach a better future by December 2030. And with that whole thing in mind, it is also a complete, similar like the World Economic Forum and the UN have said since the pandemic, a, a complete reset because what the 17 SDGs do is a new economy, a new equality, for everybody on earth. It's not just the US, it's not just China, it's not just Africa, it's not just Europe. It's for everyone. And uh, we need to, this is what you mentioned, you just have to change, you have to do it a different way that's sustainable, and we're seeing those results. So I thank you for that. And, and uh, I really believe truly that uh, you are the one of the most wonderful advocates for the SDGs that I've ever met. And you're very passionate to make sure that it's a bottom up approach that you address the indigenous peoples and those who might not even speak one of the languages of which the SDGs are written in to make sure that they can understand it. Um, during this time of the pandemic, have you had a certain discussion or read a certain book or had anything that's impacted your life or had an aha moment that said, boy, this is the climate showing us what we need to do. Have you had anything specific that's touched your life? 
Yes, I mean, I do. I do have something who touched me personally and who touched me globally. So personally, I got like a time where you are not traveling and then I was back home with the communities. And then I realized more and more that if we don't have our nature, we have nothing. We can survive. We can close all the border. We can build a wall, but we can survive. And these things, I think many people realize it. When they close, they decided to close all the border from the very big countries, they make announcement to the country like mine who close, they left one thing, the food shift. The chipping of the food was open to all the world. They say no car travel, no plane travel, like no one can go out of the border. But if you have a car who are carrying a foot, yes. you can pass the border. So that's make me realize how human being we are depending from the environment. Because that's also what indigenous peoples try to tell the, to the world for centuries and centuries. We say that when we protect our nature, we protect ourselves. And we have to do it because nature is the best supermarket that we do have without adding a value and a single product. So that's make me personally like, yes, it's confirming all what we are saying for centuries as indigenous peoples. So the world leaders realize now they cannot be autosufficient if they close the border and they think that the food that they are producing can be enough for them. They have to exchange what the nature gives us better. Exactly. And they cross all the border. So this is really very important. So then globally, what I understood, like everyone coming like, oh, we are losing a lot. So we have to inject money in the economy. So they put a billions and billions that they wanted to inject in the economy because they are very scared to lose the jobs, very scared to lose the power of them industry or the power of them countries. Yes. And then they call it like, oh, while we need the food, we have to call it green recovery. So I found that very amazing. Then it's amazed me a lot. I said like, okay, fine. You can use this amount of the money like what you wanted to use it. It is not about job only. It is not about economy only. It is about the nature. It is about the environment. So this money need to be injected on a protecting the nature. It need to be injected on the fighting against climate change. It need to be injected about the restoration of the ecosystem because we need the fertile land. We need the clean water. We need the biodiversity to come up. So for me, it's really like obvious when we say the world lost like uh, more than 60% of our species. I'm like, we get a unique opportunity to restore it now because with this virus, with this pandemic, we know that we are really very vulnerable when we destroy the ecosystem. We pay the bill immediately. So when we restore, we protect the ecosystem, we save our lives, we save the health, the economy, and the food. So that's make me realize many things. And then I'm like, well, we need to continue the way that we are doing the advocacy, but we need to make it very hard and very fast now. And then the countries need to understand we don't have to beg anymore to get like 100 billion for the climate change, give the money now and then climate action now. No, it's have to be a reality. They have to put these billions into the climate action, into the biodiversity restorations. And that can create naturally the jobs, that can reboost naturally the economy. 
and that can create a justice and equality among the people in a very natural way without that we come the numbers it is not the statistic but it is the realities that we are living during this break we've been on several calls together with the club of rome and this planetary emergency group um, who is also the UN is involved and many other organizations are involved to specifically help leaders, world leaders and governments um, know how important it is that the, the monies, the bailouts, where they go, that they get involved in and return to our environment, to, to sustainability, to movements, to protect our biodiversity in our ecosystem and to keep us within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. And you've been one of the major signers on several of those letters that have gone out. And matter of fact, I believe just last week was one of the letters that, that went out and was published all over uh, with the Club of Rome and the UN and, and with you of how that money should be put back into good use. I do, do not I, I, I take a little bit of harder stance, and I don't know if you do as well. I do not believe that companies should be bailed out if they weren't sustainable, if they didn't divest and start ESG practices, um, then and they were harming the planet, then they uh, really don't always deserve to be bailed out or given, given monies to recover. Now, if they have a plan for environmental social governance and sustainability deep into their operating models into their business plan and do not go back to business as usual. I believe that they deserve to have some monies to help uh, get our planet where it needs to be. That's part of the big reset. The other reason I, I, I spoke to you about this, you know, what's the future right now in, in some areas and, and in chat, it's uh, obviously a little bit different, but we're wearing these, these face masks to go out. We're using personal protection equipment and disinfections. If we push that model forward into the future, the next step is a gas mask. The next step is an oxygen mask. The next step is a, is a space suit in order to enjoy, enjoy our environment. That's not the future that I want, and I'm sure it's not the future that you want. And so we need to, to uh, fix what we've damaged and get back into that safe operating space of our planetary boundaries so that just to function in the future, we don't have those extreme measures. And that leads me to my second to last question for you. Uh, and it's similar to the burning question, but it's a little bit more specific that I want you to only answer. What does a world that works for everyone look like for Hindu? I mean, definitely, I agree with you. Uh, what the world that will look like for me is the world where everyone will be free of his movement. It's the world where my peoples can cross the border and find water and pastures and leave the way to the nature to get restored in a natural way the world where I can go out without fear, without fearing about my own other human being that work next, next to me, if he contaminate me or I contaminate him. So I think it's really very important that the rules we are fixing in our life to be the rules that we wanted for ourselves, for our children. Of course, you said today we are wearing the mask. We are using the gels, keeping a one meter of distance. And what will be tomorrow? Then what is the next? When there is new pandemic, what are we going to do? So if we have to look what causes this pandemic and fight this, I think we can live in a better and safe place. I know. And we saying. all know because we destroy our resources, we destroy the environment, and then the environment responding. Because to now, there are a lot of discussions that, like I can't explain to my community how the virus come and what is the origin of the virus. 
because even from the peoples where it started, they say, oh, the, uh, is, it, it is the uh, insect. No, it is the birds. No, it is the animals. No, it is whatever. So what am I going to say to my community who do not know about it and who innocently getting sick from it? Yes. So, so, so that's the thing. So I want to the world where I can live without fears when I can move freely with my peoples and where we can live as community, as families or together, but not getting beautiful. scared from each other, no. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Hindu. And my last question for you is really, it is for you because you have numerous messages for those who you represent and for the works that you do. If you were able to go up to every individual on this earth individually and give them just one message, your message, what would that message be that could have the power to change their life and our world forever? Is there a message that you have that you want to give our listeners like that from you? I think if I can meet like every single individual around the world from the eight to the nine billion peoples. Mm -hmm. I will tell from the children to the all, man to the women. I will tell them in them first, our features, it's your decisions. And that, that's mean like every single action count. If you use your way of living for the sustainable you living, it is for all the world that you are doing it. So a single action count. You don't have to do a big one, but in a small count. If every one of us planting a tree, protecting a water, living with solidarity with his neighbors, and choosing for a sustainable life, not for the fossil fuels. I think we can do it. We can make it. We can change it. It is not only the politician who can make us change. We are the master of our life and we can change our own life because it is not a president or a minister or someone who can tell me, Hindu, if you use the local water, it's good, or if you use a bottle water transfer by plan from every place, it's good because they are not the master of my life. Yes. I drink this water so I can make my own decision. So make your decisions. Our future, it is your decision. Thank you so much, Hindu. We, we, the, the message is, is so beautiful because you're letting everybody know that nobody is a passenger on our spaceship Earth. Everybody is a crew member and has, no matter how big or small, has a part to, to guide our destiny. And you put it so eloquently. Thank you so much for your time. And we've, I know I've already taken so much of it. So I'm, I'm going to thank you and let you go. And, and I wish you all the best. And we will see each other very soon, if not online at one of our events many events that we yeah. go to thank I wish you, you all the best thank, thank you so God. much Hindu. Yeah, i will see you physically soon because we are human and because we are yes. fighting for the cause we are believing on it so we will meet the pandemic cannot be if a, a block is for us and the climate we will fight it together we will, yes, we will. our world beautifully together thank you so much all my listeners and myself, we're with you 100%. So you come with a big tribe. So I thank you very much and you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Hindu. Bye-bye.